Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church of Crockett, Texas. It's a joy for me to welcome each and every one of you here today. And those of you who are listening to KIVY KIV Radio or watching on our Facebook live stream, thank you all. And if you are watching on Facebook or present, I do hope that you'll take a moment to register your attendance with us. Let us know you're, you're here and watching and present with us. Thank you. I do have uh, one thing I would like to share with you today. In our midst is a young man who was awarded the prestigious Lakeview Legend Award for Leadership, Encouragement, Gratitude, Excellence, Nobility, and Discipleship, Ethan Adams. Stand up, Ethan, come on. <laughs> this was his first year at Lakeview Camp. He represented our church quite well, and he looks forward to going back. Congratulations to you again. There are a number of announcements in your bulletin I hope you'll make a note of, including a farewell party for Brandon. We truly hate to see you go, and we, uh, again, are inviting you to stay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, just thought I'd get that in if possible. But uh, there are other announcements on your uh, bulletin. I hope you'll make a note of, especially those at um, uh, one coming up July 3rd, the first Sunday breakfast. That's going to be a delicious meal. Uh, invite your friends. It's a great way to uh, get people who may not have a church family to um, uh, get to know us. Uh, so that concludes the announcements. I invite you now to turn in your bulletin to our call to worship. Let's join together in this responsive reading. <laughs> Gather near, hear the faint flutter of wings. You are in the presence of God. God shall hide us in the shadow of his wings and protect us like the apple of his eye. God shall place our feet on the path of peace and keep us from slipping. God turns his Gather here. Let his wings of grace enfold you and bring you peace. Feel God's strength around you and let your songs of praise rise in the air. Let's stand together and sing number 127, God Meal, thou great Jehovah. affirmation of faith. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. seated. You'll notice a number of prayer requests in your bulletin. I do hope and pray you'll continue to lift those up during your devotional time. Let us join together in a word of prayer. God Almighty, we gather in your name this morning to bring you our petitions and prayers to sing your praises, to hear and study your word. Our God and Savior, we humble ourselves before your greatness, your majesty, and your wonder, and your mystery. We recognize you as a creator and sovereign ruler of the universe. And we give you all the glory and honor and praise. We thank you also that you have given us the liberty to call you Father, Abba. And that your greatness includes your eternal love and acceptance of us in Jesus Christ. Father, we confess our sins and accept by faith your promised forgiveness. We're so grateful we can let go of that guilt as we turn our lives over to you. And we thank you, Father, for the shed blood of Jesus Christ that makes us whole and brings us together as your children. We thank you for the Lord's Day, the reminder of resurrection power that's available to our lives now. We thank you for giving us a preview of the established kingdom, for giving us this foretaste of glory divine. We know we can't truly understand everything there is to know about the nature of your future kingdom, but you have blessed us with a reflection of what is to come through this fellowship and the opportunity to worship you as one body in Christ. Father, as we wait for that day to come, according to your will, we're, we're mindful of our responsibilities and duties. You've not created us to be idle. You've given us dominion and responsibility over creation. So we ask that you would equip us for this task of developing and caring for creation. And we ask that you'd send your Holy Spirit to flood our souls in your presence. Empower us for the building of your kingdom, for the making of disciples. Father, this morning we also pray for our nation and its leaders, that they would follow your paths of wisdom, justice, and righteousness. We pray for our nation and states and towns economies that you would minimize the suffering and despair that many are experiencing today. We pray for unity in our nation that we might truly become one people under God. We also pray for your church that in the goals and objectives on which she focuses, she would not lose focus on our primary mission in proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Father, we're mindful of those in our congregation and church family and community who are struggling 
with health issues, with issues that plague their emotions, with issues of grief on the loss of loved ones. Oh God, we look to you for healing for their lives. And we pray that you would stir up within us discerning ways that we can minister to them as well. Father, do your kingdom work among us. Equip us for the responsibilities you give us as a church. Empower our leadership with vision and wisdom and make strong disciples of each and every one of us. All these things we ask in the name of our Savior and Lord who taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Come now to a place in our service where Jolene will be offering the children a message. Please join her over near the choir area. Good morning. Good to see you all here this morning. Uh, we are going to talk today about how God would like for us to pray. Uh, even Jesus' closest friends, the disciples, wanted to know what the proper way was to give prayers. And he told them, first of all, uh, that we should keep our prayers simple. Doesn't have to be elaborate, doesn't have to be fancy words, just something from our hearts. And even if our prayers are really long or really short, uh, God knows what is in our heart and knows what we are, are uh, needing even before we say the words. He also told his disciples that when we pray, we shouldn't make a big public display on the street corners uh, of what we are saying to God because uh, it makes us look like we think we are so great that we uh, are able to have this public conversation with God. Uh, he wants us to pray in a quiet place uh, and give words of thanks, of praise, express our needs, and tell what we are sorry for. So in Matthew 6, we are given the example of a perfect prayer. And guess what? We just finished praying it, didn't we? What do we call it? The Lord's Prayer. And we're going to go through it line by line. I know you know the words, but we're going to go through it line by line and see what words really mean. So what does the first line say? Our Father who our Father who art in heaven. Excellent. And this means that God is our loving Father and we are his special children and we are never alone. What does the second line say? Can you see it? Hallowed be thy name. Okay, I, I think I had the microphone up to my mouth. Hallowed be thy name. That's right. Hallowed means holy. And so even though God wants us to call him Father, he is divine and he is deserving all of our respect. All right, let's look at the nether, the next. What does, you want to read? No, okay. You, would you like to read? 
Okay, can you see what it says? Thy kingdom. Can you start with thy kingdom? Kingdom come, they will be done. On earth, on earth as, as it is in heaven. Very good. This part of the prayer says that your kingdom, God's kingdom, uh, is desired by the people on earth so we can live in peace and love just like what happens in heaven. Next. Can you see, you want to come up and see what this is? No. You want to read? No? Okay. Give, give us our, give this, give us this day our daily bread. That means that God uh, is, uh, who already knows what we need, uh, uh, but we need to ourselves keep in mind what the difference is between needs. Needs are air, water, food, shelter, as compared to wants. Wants are, I want a new toy. I want a new uh, bicycle. A new cat. Uh-huh. You hear that, Mom? <laughs> I see an eye roll, but that's okay. You Keep working on it, okay? <laughs> uh, all right, let's see what the next line says. Can you see that? And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. What is a trespass? What do you think? Going on someone's property when it's not yours. All right, that is the legal, I bet you, that's the legal a definition of trespass is going on somebody's property. It's an old-fashioned word that means doing something that is uh, against uh, God's rules. And we know that we all make mistakes, don't we? God knows we make mistakes. We're, we're human. Uh, and so all we're doing is asking God, please forgive our mistakes. And while we're at it, let's learn to forgive other people's mistakes also. All right, how about the next one? And lead us. And lead us. Can you see it? And? And lead us not into... Temptation. Temptation, but deliver from evil. Great. And in this part of the prayer, God says, well, don't lead us in, uh, lead us someplace uh, that will keep us from doing the right thing. And while we're at it, protect us from the bad things that are in the world. All right. Last line. Anybody want to do last line? Okay. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Excellent job. And this last part of the prayer is probably the best one because it affirms that uh, God will be in charge forever. And that's a happy feeling. So prayer is a special way of talking to God who loves you, who knows everything about you, and wants you to have the best life possible. Now, your, your activity today is to make this right here. So if you'll give me a minute, we will hand out the packets. And thank you for coming up. Good job, guys.
one soul at a time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Please stand as you are able for today's reading of scripture, Genesis 32, verses 22 through 30. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the fort of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, What is it they ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Mm-hmm. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Will you pray with me? God, our Heavenly Father, it is my prayer that you'll hide me behind the cross. And that through the words I speak or in spite of them, let your spirit flow wildly across our congregation to move thoroughly within each one of our souls and transform us more and more into the likeness of Christ. This we pray in his name. Amen. Thank you, Troy, for that great reading. So yes, today we'll be talking about the life of Jacob a little bit. And his story is one of my favorite stories in the Bible because it gives us a glimpse of what God does when he takes humanity as we are and shapes us into what he wants us to be. So this morning I'd like to spend some time talking about discipleship. What really is discipleship? It's a maturation and transformation process that in a sense involves wrestling with God. And today's passage in Genesis 32 offers us a great teaching on how God seeks to change us and enable us to bear his image as we were created to. Jacob is on his way back home to Canaan with his family after a 20-year period in Haran. And I think this gentleman is scared to death because his brother Esau is coming to meet him with 400 men. And I want to tell you, in Jacob's mind, this was no welcome party. It was an army. Remember, Jacob is the one who deceived and cheated his older brother out of his father's blessing. And that was a serious offense in those days. In modern terms, it's like me cheating you out of your inheritance. So Jacob wanted to figure out a way to protect himself from Esau's wrath. And he came up with a plan. After splitting up his household into two camps to try and avoid complete annihilation, he sent them on ahead separately to meet with Esau before he went. Jacob intends to arrive later, spending the night alone, no doubt in desperate prayer. He was so afraid he couldn't sleep anyway. But a strange man who shows up and wrestles Jacob till daybreak interrupts his plans. And at some point during this weird contest, Jacob comes to realize or believe that he is actually wrestling with God. And when this opponent decides it's time to end the match, he dislocates Jacob's hip and demands to be released. And Jacob, in significant pain, replies, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Well, this response clearly pleases God who pronounces this blessing on Jacob. He says, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. 
So now Jacob limps toward his tense reunion with his own brother with a weakened body, but with a strengthened faith. But having wrestled with God, he now knows his prayers regarding Esau will be answered. And I want you to carefully observe what God did when he or his representative agent, if you will, wrestled Jacob. Remember Jacob began the night dreading Esau's arrival. He was full of fear and desperation, but he ended the night of struggle with God's blessing and renewed faith. Okay? He was a different man from the way the night began. He was feeling blessed. He had a renewed faith and peace about things. You see, God blessed Jacob with a newfound sense of trust in his creator. A trust and peace that God would take care of him. And I find it interesting that God didn't simply speak to Jacob like in a dream or a vision as he had at other times. Y'all remember Jacob's ladder, we heard about that in the Bible. This time God addressed Jacob's fear by requiring him to wrestle all night. Probably felt to Jacob like a badly timed hassle when he just wanted comfort and assurance. I think sometimes we, when we want God's comfort, he sends it in unexpected ways. Even unwanted packages, he sends it to us. God even afflicted Jacob with a debilitating injury. And this had the effect of making Jacob even more vulnerable to Esau, forcing Jacob's faith to more fully trust in God and not himself. And finally, what we see in this passage, I believe, is that wrestling with God changed Jacob's identity. Now many folks without a careful study of this verse overlook something I find very important here. The name Jacob in Hebrew means supplanter or deceiver or to take the place of another. This name reflects manipulation and cheating. And this is exactly what Jacob had done with his brother and his father through deceiving his own father to get the blessing. But the new name, Israel, it means prince of God, or more exactly, strives with God. It reflects dependence on God, getting through life with God, in contrast to relying on oneself. Now, now in Jacob's case, it was in relying on his own former cheating, manipulating ways. But instead of that, now Jacob was going to become dependent on God. He was no longer going to be known as one who received his blessings by deception. This time, he received God's blessing by prevailing with God through faith. This struggle turned out to be an extremely gracious gift of restoration. And in our passage today, it's clear that Jacob's persistent faith pleased God. And that's why he rewarded Jacob's request for a blessing. So what does all this mean? I believe it means that when God draws us into a stage of life where we find ourselves figuratively wrestling with him, there's always more going on than we first understand. God always uses it to transform us for good. The truth is this, it's precisely within our wrestling with God that we discover and receive the blessings God wants for us. And I want you to seriously consider what I'm about to share. God really wants to bless each one of you. And if you persist in the process of wrestling with God, of working out your discipleship, and don't give up, God will bless you with that which you need the most in your life. And I'm not necessarily talking about physical needs. It could be spiritual transformation. It could be protection, among other things. So be thinking to yourself, what do you really need from God right now? What blessing would you like from him for your life? 
As we consider this passage, it's also important to know there are times when God only releases his blessings after a season of prolonged and sometimes even painful wrestling with him. I want you to remember, God sought out Jacob for this match. God was the initiator. Here was Jacob stewing in his own anxiety over Esau and his approaching slaughter squad when God showed up. And I want you to remember some things needed to change in Jacob's life. Can you imagine the guilt Jacob was carrying for his deceitful and manipulative treatment of his own brother? And if you read the whole story of Jacob's life, this wasn't the only time Jacob was manipulative and deceitful. His life reflected little trust in God and more trust in his own deceitful ways. In fact, I believe God was trying to give Jacob a taste of his own medicine when his father-in-law Laban tricked Jacob into marrying Leah first instead of Rachel, who Jacob really wanted. And so this wrestling match drew Jacob out of his fearful preoccupations and forced him to focus on God. It forced Jacob to realize that God would bless Jacob in God's own time. And the same is true for us. We need to trust less in our own desires and fears and personal dispositions and see God first. What was it Jesus said? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. This is the lifelong human journey we all need to embrace with our lives. Paul calls it working out our salvation. In Philippians 2, Paul writes, Therefore, my dear friends, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you to will and to act according to his purpose. John Wesley calls it sanctification. The sense in which we're to work out our salvation is, is twofold, I think. First, the Greek verb rendered work out means to continually work to bring something to completion or fruition. And we do this by actively pursuing obedience. The trembling he experiences is this attitude Christians are to have in pursuing this goal. A healthy fear of offending God through disobedience. We should fear the very idea of disobeying God. And we should have an awe and a respect for his majesty and his holiness in our presence. We work out our salvation by, by going to the very source of our salvation. The word of God wherein we renew our hearts and our minds. That's what Paul writes about in Romans 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but by the transforming and renewing of your minds. That's how we come into his presence, with a spirit of reverence and awe. The question we've got to ask ourselves is this. Are we, have we been coming all the way into relationship with Jesus Christ, studying his word, spending time in prayer, serving his kingdom to make disciples, and seeking to know all we can about him and what he wants for our lives. Or are we just stepping into the church long enough to dip our fingers into the holy water so God will notice? And then we scurry away and continue on with our other pursuits of more important matters. Let me be clear. People do not drift toward holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not simply gravitate toward godliness or prayer or obedience to scripture or faith and delight in the Lord. We drift if you want to know what we drift toward, we drift toward compromise, and we call that tolerance. We drift toward disobedience, 
and we call it freedom. We drift toward superstition, and we call it faith. We even cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control, and we call it relaxation. We slouch toward prayless, prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we've escaped legalism. We slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves we have been liberated. What you've just heard is nothing more than a description of human natural instinct. This world tries to pull us away from God while God's Holy Spirit is pleading with us to come closer to him. True faith, real discipleship is about wrestling with God. You see, faith isn't something you just pick up here and there by osmosis. It's something that takes work and study and discipline. The Christian life is something that you immerse yourself into. You wrestle with God every, every aspect of life you encounter. Elton Trueblood, in an article entitled The New Man for Our Times, he writes, we've not advanced very far in our spiritual lives if we have not encountered the basic paradox of freedom, that we are most free when we are bound. But not just any way of being bound will suffice. He says, what matters is the character of our binding. The one who would be an athlete but is unwilling to discipline his body by regular exercise and by abstinence isn't free to excel on the field or the track. His failure to train rigorously denies him the freedom to run with the desired speed and endurance that he would like to have. The same is true with a Christian life. Discipline is the price of freedom. You see, the Christian life is something that grows out of a deep desire and longing, and at times even a struggle to find out for ourselves who Jesus really is. We need to wrestle with God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a theologian who died by hanging in one of Hitler's detention facilities, one of the greatest theologians, of the past few hundred years. He spoke about the idea of cheap grace. What is cheap grace? Well, it's something many Christians actually embrace and promote because it doesn't require transformation. Listen to Bonhoeffer's words written in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. Cheap grace, Bonhoeffer says, is to hear the gospel preached as follows. Well, of course you have sinned, but now everything is forgiven, so you can stay as you are and enjoy the consolation of forgiveness. Bonhoeffer says the main defect of such a proclamation is that it contains no demand for discipleship. Discipleship is a costly process that takes time and involves wrestling with God over all the deepest issues of one's life. And if you follow Jesus and his disciples through the Gospels, you'll find places where he rebuked and corrected them for their erroneous ways of thinking. It's not discipleship unless real transformation and enlightened perspective takes place in one's life. And that's not always pleasant. Of course, we don't think we need to change. Many of us probably don't want to change, but God calls us to change. What was it Jesus said in Matthew 16? If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So instead of controlling our lives, we're called to turn them over to Christ as Lord. In Jacob's case, he needed to leave his deceiving, cheating ways behind and learn to place his whole trust on God's providence. It wouldn't surprise me if at the beginning of that wrestling match, Jacob prayed, God, would you just get rid of this guy? This is the last thing I need right now. I'm fixing to face my brother Esau. 
But what he discovered in that wrestling match was that the wrestling was a means of God's grace, a channel for God's blessing on him. And you remember what happened at the end of the story? If you read on in Genesis, he knew the Lord was with him. I'm sure he did after receiving that blessing. And, and as he approached Esau, he knew the Lord was all he needed when finally facing his brother after all these years. And when they came face to face, the most amazing thing, the most amazing thing happened. The brothers embraced. There was no fight to the finish. Jacob found a peace in approaching his brother that he hadn't had for 20 years. It was a time of love and reconciliation. In that moment, Jacob realized how God indeed provided for him what he could not provide for himself. And let me be clear, the same can be true for all of you and myself. So let me ask you, are you in the middle of a personal struggle? Is there an area of your life that needs transformation? Do you need God to step in with his intervening grace in your life in some way? What is it that you really need from God right now? What blessing do you want from him? And how badly do you want it? Don't let God go. Keep wrestling him for his blessings. And God will meet you in your anguish, in your fear, and in your uncertainty. But he may not meet you in the way you expect or desire. Your greatest ally may show up looking at first like your adversary, inciting you to wrestle with him. If that happens, remember Jacob. There are multiple blessings in the wrestling. You might not need soft words of comfort. You might not need to be left alone with your thoughts, and you might not, not even need sleep. But you and I, what you and I probably need is God's blessing. And believe me, he wants to bless all of us. So not if, but when God calls you to wrestle with him, it's an invitation to hold on to him with all the strength you got and, and not let him go. When you do, you'll receive his blessing and discover freedom and peace and God you have never encountered before. So don't give up. Find mentors in Christ. Find people who've studied the Bible longer than you have. Join a Sunday school class, a Bible study. Keep wrestling with God. He loves to bless that kind of determined faith. And if you do, I promise, that your life will be transformed and blessed beyond your imagination. You know why? Because the word of God truly is for the people of God. Amen. This morning we close our service with an invitation to join this amazing loving church family so I would ask anyone that would like to unite with this church by transfer of membership or profession of faith to come forward as we stand together and sing our closing hymn, Oh Happy Day That Fixed My Choice, number 391. Please stand and please come.
is a joy for me to introduce to you Ms. Sandra Rouse. She comes to us today on transfer of her membership to this church. We're delighted to welcome her to First United Methodist Church Crockett. I would like to ask you the one question that we ask of all new members. Sandra, that is, uh, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and promise to support it with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? I will. We're delighted then to welcome you, and we respond with our own congregational response as found in your, in your bulletin below the closing hymn. This is how we welcome new members. Please join with me in making this covenant with Sandra. We rejoice to recognize you as members of Christ's Holy Church, Church and bid you welcome to this congregation of the United Methodist Church. With you, we renew our vows to uphold it with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and witness. I have to tell you that um, Sandra told me while she was standing up here that she really feels at home here oh. in this church. Amen. And she loves her Sunday school class. Ah. Which class is that? Debbie's class? Debbie. The neighborhood Debbie. class. Debbie. Just, just letting you know, got a great class over there. <laughs> okay. anyway, but we're, we're honored and blessed that you've already found a, a nice yes. little niche in a Sunday school class to, uh, to grow in the Lord. We welcome you, and I want to invite you to join me in welcoming Santa right now. All of you will have an opportunity to personally greet and tell your name to Sandra so she can get to know you and uh, after, after this service. Let us pray. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>